All right, it's 7 o'clock. If we welcome each one, thank you for being here for our midweek Bible study. Uh, right now we are focused on the topic and subject of parenting God's way. And we are in lesson three, about halfway through lesson three. And we have visitors tonight. Uh, we're thankful especially for your presence. It's good to see you. So if you'll open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 2, we covered questions 1 through 5. We're going to pick up here with question 6 as we're focused in this particular lesson on learning from Bible parents. So as we read in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, things that were written before were written for what? Our learning. And so we understand we're not under the Old Testament, we're not under that covenant, and yet we know it's part of God's inspired word. It's been preserved for some very good reasons, but it is written for our learning. So we're going back here mainly to the Old Testament to look at some Bible families that we can learn some good things from and learn from their bad to hopefully not repeat that and avoid that in our lives. And so we've already looked at Abraham's family um, and what God said to him and what he wanted from him. Uh, Isaac and Rebekah's family, Jacob and his sons, Joshua and his household, Hannah and Samuel. And that's where we ended a week ago. So Eli and his sons, 1 Samuel chapter 2 and 3 is where we'll be focused at right now in our Bibles. If you're not there, 1 Samuel 2, 1 Samuel 3. You know, in verses 22 through 25, we do read of when Eli comes to his sons, he gets on to them, he admonishes them. Um, there's some rebuking here of their evil dealings. In verse 23, um, well, let's back up to verse 22. Now, Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. Know, my sons, for it's not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father because the Lord desired to kill them. My question is, he gets on to his sons here. He, he speaks of their evil dealings that he's heard from the, the people. So why was God bringing judgment upon Eli as well and his house? And that gets in uh, to these verses as a part of that answer, verses 27 uh, through uh, 34. Uh, so there's eight verses there. Uh, let's take uh, maybe two apiece. Let me start with Todd here. Then we're going to go to Ken. And then we'll go, uh, Michael, you get us reading? Okay. So two, four, six, and then let me uh, then go to, to you, Brad. Okay. Yes, sir. Then a man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I not indeed reveal myself to the house of your father? when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I not choose them from all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to carry an ephod before me? And did I not give to the house to the house of your father all the fire offerings of the sons of Israel? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place, and honor your sons more than me? to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Therefore, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house, so that no one in it will reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Yet I will not cut off every man of yours from my altar, so that your eyes will fail from weeping and your soul grieve. 
and all the increase of your house will die in the prime of life. And this will be the sign to you, which will come in regard to your, to your two sons, Ophni and Phineas, on the same day, both of them will die. Okay. So a man of God is sent to who? A man of God. Right? Eli is a man of God, but a man of God is sent to him, the priest and judge of Israel, Eli, who is not in ways of his family, behaving like a man of God. And what does the man of God say to Eli that reveals to us specifically, at least in the verses we read, why God said judgment's going to be coming to Eli and to his sons? What did he say? If we sum it up. One of the things is that there was showing irreverence towards the Lord's sacrifices. For example, in verse 29, Why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering which I have commanded in my dwelling place? And what does he do? Right, you honor your sons more than you honor me. You make yourselves fat. He says, with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Now, literally, they made themselves fat. When Eli died in chapter 4, when he heard that his sons had been killed, when when he heard the ark of God had been captured by the Philistines in verse 18 of chapter 4, he fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died, for the man was old and heavy. Well, we know why he was heavy, or at least part of the reason, and it's exposed here, you made yourselves fat with the best of the offerings of Israel, my people. And so he said in verse 30, far be it, but, but now the Lord says, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. So in essence, God is saying to Eli, you what? By your actions, by your attitude, by participating really in some of the sins and unlawfulness of your sons, you despise me. You honor them more than you honor me. Other thoughts or comments, Norma? Well, this is one of those those sad situations where uh, they've already been raised. They've been raised improperly based on the actions that they came out with and now almost out of grief, the father's looking at what he's reaping now and you know and, and is now admonishing them way too late uh this and, and, and as god was talking about in the scriptures there he, uh, it came through as the children were a higher priority of whatever they wanted apparently than mm. following after god's god's law and raising them in the proper way yeah next lesson lesson four we're going to be focused on setting the right example for our children. Here's a failure in setting the right example. He was right there participating with them and not showing reverence toward the Lord's sacrifices and making themselves fat off what was being offered to, to God. Um, and didn't Jesus say something about family and him and who must be first and who has to be honored more? He who loves father or mother more than me is not what? not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's in the text of Matthew 10, 34 through 37. Norm P. He never once removed his sons from the honor and position that they held. And even with all the reports he got, they were still priests when they died. And they should have been cut off from being priests a long time before. Exactly. Exactly. Um, they should not have been allowed to continue as priests because these priests were corrupt and they were wicked. Todd? Yeah, we we sometimes wonder how much tough love is necessary when your kids get older and start getting into some of this really serious stuff. Uh, And there's this debate (coughs) on, well, how should I treat this child who's obviously falling away or getting into some serious crime? Brett, I think, talked about not giving them a soft place to land, right, so that they can 
hit rock bottom like the prodigal son and maybe turn back. Right. Uh, here you see he's he's saying some of the right stuff in verses 22 through 25, right. but he needs to do something. Sometimes we talk about, you know, at a certain point you become an enabler to the sin mm -hmm. because they've always got mom and dad to go back to, to stay at their house or whatever. Well, we need to go further than not enabling. We need to disable the behavior by taking away the that soft plate yeah. so that they cannot continue. Like, like Norm says, you're done. You're not a priest anymore if you're going to behave this way. Well said. Yeah, exactly. Jeff? I was thinking they weren't alone in their sins either. You know, there were people that participated in the sins, and they also led others into the same type of sins. Now, and, and I want to make sure there's no special exemptions for the Levites from what the law called for was the true punishment, right? Were they not to be stoned to death for those sins? Didn't matter if they were Levites or not, right? That's right. Yeah, so the whole saying. group failed as well, not just the parents. Think about what God did to Nadab and Abihu for using a different fire. These boys, grown men, are laying with the women by the door of the tabernacle. And it's not a secret. Eli said, all the people are telling me about your evil dealings. It's well known what these young men are engaged in and then how they're treating the sacrifices of, of the Lord as well. They'll go in there. We didn't read that, that, that passage, but earlier in the book, it talks about them going in and, 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 and uh, sticking the meat and pulling it out before it's fully cooked and where it's raw. Um, that's back in, uh, earlier in chapter 2, uh, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. Obviously, they didn't know him by not having a relationship with him or weren't being faithful to him and his will. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling. And then he'd thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pod, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up, so they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, they, before they burned the fat, the priest's servant would come and say to the man who sacrificed, Give meat for roasting to the priest, for he will not take boiled meat from you but raw and the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, and you may take as much as your heart desires. He would then answer him, no, but you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. And you were talking to Jeff about the effect they were having on others. Well, there, there's part of that, the negative impact they're having on the people who are coming in a sincere way to worship God. But you have the priests who are supposed to be leaders of God's people and instructing them in God's ways. And again, you think about Nadab and Abihu, just some strange fire. Well, they offer strange fire and God sent down fire upon them. Certainly these boys are about to be judged. And yes, they should have been put to death already. We're going to see with David and his family upcoming another big failure when you don't discipline your children and, and the fruits of that, okay? All right, go ahead, Sam. The people who were doing the sacrificing, I mean, from, from the way that verses 12 through 17 read, I assume that they kind of relented, they gave in to the, uh, the, priest's, ser the priest's servant, but uh, you can kind of see that like, even right here, it's an example of not raising up your children the right way, and this is leading to a corruption in the entire <clears throat> system of worship. And I guess going forward into the way uh, the Jews worshipped in the time of Jesus, I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's like a huge slippery slope, but it's interesting how one man failing to raise his kids that way influences a lot of people in negative Yeah, especially when they're in a leadership position like that. And it's supposed to be leading the worshipers in pure worship, and they've corrupted it in how a little leaven, as the Bible says, leavens the whole lump. And yeah, good point, Jason. Application, or are you fixing to get the applications for us? Um, yeah, that's upcoming. You're going to hold back? Pull back? All right, let's go to chapter 3 real quick then, and verses 11 through 14. Read those, comment on that, and then we'll get to some more application for us. 
Um, where do we get to? All right. Avery, you want to take another stab at it? We're more long-suffering than that. 1 Samuel 3, and if you'll do 11 and 12, I'm going to get Jason 13 and 14. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knew. Because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he did not rebuke them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. All right. So what is exposed here? One thing that really stood out to me, God says, I'm going to judge Eli and his house for the iniquity which he knows. And we know that from what we read to begin with back in chapter 2, when he came up to them and addressed them about their, their evil dealings. He, he had full knowledge of what was going on. But with knowledge comes what? Greater responsibility and accountability. For him, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin, James 4, 17. Um, and his sons made themselves vile, and he didn't restrain them. I think Jason said didn't rebuke them. Correct? Is that New American Standard Bible? Okay. And then you go back to chapter 2. Well, didn't he rebuke them? Didn't he get on to them? He didn't restrain them. He didn't stop them. He didn't, as Jeff and Norm P., I think, touched upon, according to the law of Moses, these men shouldn't have been living still, you know, serving as priest, let alone let alone serving as priests, but uh, because of their sins and the fornication and dishonoring God and the sacrifices, they should have been removed as priests, but also removed, period, um, uh, capital punishment with their sins. Comments on, on, on this passage or the application? Okay, Norm A. Uh, Eli's sin is, is a willful sin. This is something he knew it. And he kept doing it, and it just goes to show that what well, you're really on borrowed time there, because uh, God's patience will run out with that, and, and there's there's no way of coming back from something that you just I'm determined to do it. I'm going to do it. That's you making that decision. Right. Willful sin reminds me of Hebrews 10:26. Uh, after having received knowledge of the truth. Speaks of sinning willfully there, right? Jason? The thing to me that's very sobering is, I mean, yes, Eli said something to them. Obviously, he didn't rebuke them enough, but he did say something to them, but it's too little too late. And so as, as parents, uh, we have to understand that it has to be from the beginning. Uh, now, I'm not saying uh, if you wait too long, you should never start. Obviously, it's better to start than to never start at all, regardless of what age they are. But as your children get older, teenage, you know, however uh, old, it, it comes to a point where, okay, you have now lost the time that you should have been training and disciplining them, and now this is the, the repercussions of that, the consequences of not doing that. And so we need to understand we can't wait. No, no, don't wait. Don't push Christian control until they hit the teenage years. Good luck with that. <clears throat> but, uh, no, you, you, we're going to be studying more about training and discipline and those scriptures and one of the Proverbs, and maybe in chapter 13, 24, but I'm not going to hold myself to that. Uh, but it talks about discipline the child promptly. And my marginal note says early, early. Don't wait, don't put it off, don't delay. And there's always consequences to needed punishment discipline that's delayed. It's never good. All right, Andy? Whenever you hear these old stories like this, it kind of it kind of brings home the point that the Apostle Paul tries to make to Timothy as we're trying to establish the elders in the church. Exactly. Exactly. We, we have to... We need men and 
every local church of God's people who are uh, preparing themselves hopefully early on um, whether they make the decision the congregation does for them to uh, serve and lead as elders that uh, you can't wait on that you, if, if you haven't proven yourself in the home with your family well that's something that Paul says the scripture says disqualifies, disqualifies a man that's kind of the proving ground and uh, and then Eli failed sadly miserably all right any other thoughts or comments? Okay, I thought this might get a little discussion. I didn't know I'd get this much, but a little bit. Oh, we're not gone. We're, I'll go back. Um, and today, like, I've been researching parenting secularly as well, and it seems that there's been a trend that you don't deal with um, or discipline your child right away when there's tension or um, things like that, that you, you walk away and you talk to them later. That just doesn't work with a three-year-old. You know, like, it doesn't work with a child in general. You have to address that issue when it happens or they forget. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that tension growing up. And my parents would say, go to your room, and I'd be a little span of time, but then they would join me in the room to administer the discipline. Uh, yeah, walk away. Now, the Bible doesn't say walk away. It says to address it. Now, again, we're not getting into uh, the subject as deeply as we will in a future lesson, but uh, it always, of course, needs to be from, from a heart of love and for God and for the truth and for that child and uh, pure motives and a, a, a calmness and a coolness which, you know, Sometimes I think they sent me to the room and waited a while so they could calm down from whatever foolish thing just came out of my mouth or whatever foolish thing I just did that was disobedient. Uh, probably in their wisdom, <laughs> it was torture for me the wait, but it was probably helping them to kind of get their, to discuss it themselves and then to, to calm down a bit before one of them came in to, to administer the, the discipline through the the training with the mouth, and then uh, maybe the backside, some too. So, all right. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Tris. David and his family. I'm just going to touch on this because there's so much to the, these stories that we find in uh, 2 Samuel 13 and 2 Samuel 14. So I'm just going to highlight it real quick. But David's handling of his son Amnon when he raped his half sister Tamar. What should have happened to Amnon? Again, kind of like we talked about Hophni and Phinehas, and that's why I put up those scriptures here, Leviticus 18, 6 and 9 and 29. Um, that was an abomination, what he did, and they're cursed, and they shall surely be put to death, the Lord says in the law of Moses. Here's a man after God's own heart, and you say over all his life, we see that, but there were times when there were Huge things. Now, what had to happen right before this? What maybe caused David to pull back? What had he just done somewhat recently? Oh. He, he had committed adultery. In chapter 11, he committed an adultery with Bathsheba, who was married to Uriah. Then he had Uriah basically murdered uh, in, the, in the war with Ammon, the Ammonites. And you think about how he had just failed miserably as a husband, as a father, the terrible example that he has just set. Uh, now, if any of that entered his mind and the way he handled this situation, the scriptures do not tell us that. We can only speculate or imagine that, but the way we know he should have handled it, he didn't. And because he didn't, what happened? Well, Ab Absalom, Tamar's brother, then has Amnon killed. He let things just lay still for a little while, and then kind of when Amnon had his guard down, he took him out. Now, again, if the law of Moses was applied, then Absalom wouldn't have committed murder. And after Absalom did this, what happened? He fled for a long time. And even after he came back to Jerusalem, David didn't see him right away in 2 Samuel 14 and verse 28, how much time passed? 
two years. And Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, but did not see the king's face. So their relationship continues to be one filled with a lot of, speaking of tension, tension and very strained. And then what, in, what, what ends up happening after this? Well, Absalom's treason, the insurrection, briefly taking over the throne and David and his men being driven out of Jerusalem. And then his son Absalom dying. I mean, it's just a huge, big mess, which we could maybe back up to chapter 11 with David's adultery and murder, and then we get to chapter 13 after chapter 12, and Nathan rebukes David, and David acknowledges his sin, and he loses the child that was conceived by Bathsheba, and then we get here in the rape uh, Amnon uh, does of Tamar, and then Absalom murdering his brother Amnon over that because Tamar was his sister, and then what all this happens. It's just, right, just huge snowball. And here yet, here's a, here's a man described, a man after God's own heart. Well, not, not during this period of time. He wasn't. Very sad, very heartbreaking. Okay. Uh, David and his son Solomon. Uh, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 2. First Kings chapter two, and um, Norm P, if you can do one and two, and Norm A, it's going to maybe confuse our visitors. Like who's this Norm A, Norm P thing? Because the father and the son, but Norm P, the son. If you'll do one and two, and Norm A, the father, help our visitors out. If you'll do three and four, please. As David's time drew near. Charge Solomon's son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. To keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. All right. Some good advice. Some great advice. Some great counsel, right? Um, so reading his instructions that he gave to his son Solomon, what can we take from this, you think, to instruct our children today? Much of the same, right? Got something? Be a man. Sorry? I said be a man. Okay. So he tells him, be strong, prove yourself a man, or to our daughters, prove yourself a young lady, a, a godly woman, right? Um, and, and what do you think he means, prove yourself a man? He is a male. Sorry? Do what's right. In the sight of God. Be a man of God. Prove yourself a man. Or prove yourself, if it was a daughter, prove yourself a woman, a young lady, a woman of God. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. Walk in His ways. Keep His commandments as written in the law of Moses. But we would say to our children, walk in His ways. Keep His commandments as written in the law of Christ, in the New Testament, in the doctrine, the teachings of Christ, right? Those are some the things that we can take away. And if our children will do that, what will be the result? Well, David spoke of blessings that would come to Solomon and his house, his family, his son, so that you may prosper in all that you do. Right? Um, and so blessings, I, it reminds me, and that's at the end of verse 3, uh, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. So many of the Proverbs speak in the same way, right? Of following after God's knowledge, God's wisdom, and the blessings that will come to the, the children, the sons, the daughters when they do that. It, it reminds me of what God said to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 in verses 7 and 8 after the death of Moses and Joshua now is the new leader of Israel and he's going to be leading them into the promised land, the land of Canaan. 
God says, only be strong and very courageous uh, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. The, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So to prosper, to be successful, all hinged on Joshua's faithfulness to God's word, to his law, to his statutes, to his commandments. In essence, the same thing that David is saying to his son Solomon. Again, that falls, us, falls upon, right on the shoulders of us fathers and mothers, us parents, that, that they, they, so they will know those things. We're going to have to instruct them and bring them up in God's ways so they can walk in His ways and know His commandments so they can keep His commandments as contained in the New Testament. All right. Thoughts or comments, Jason? I mean, I can't help but read this about being a man and think about Paul and his letter to the Corinthians. He doesn't act like men, but then and that's in chapter 16. But in chapter 13, it, there's this progression as a, a Christian, and you used to be a child. And so as a parent, uh, this is something for me personally, I have to, to recognize they are still children, so we should not expect them to act like men or act like women when they're children. We should develop them to be that point. So allow them to be children and to be trained, but then at some point, then they transition to where they now should be a man or should be uh, a woman. Yeah, great point. Appreciate it. Norm, this uh, speaks like a proverb, and proverbs in general are, are kind of, li they line up with the, the way God created things, the organization of his creation, and, and, and basically the idea that if you if you uh, carry out God's God-given roles that you have been given by him, then generally speaking, uh, the proverbs will carry, carry you through there. And you can sleep at night. <laughs> That's right. That's right. We're going to get into some of those proverbs. And uh, does Sean have control over that clock to turn it back to maybe seven thirty at least? I would appreciate it. All right. Solomon's admonitions to his son. Solomon, of course, wrote many or most of the proverbs. We come to Proverbs chapter one, verses eight through ten, and then verse fifteen to begin with. And uh, Brent, I'm coming to you. Melissa, you want me to skip you? And then we'll go to Andy and Tiffany. And then eventually Jeff, if we have time. So I'm going to start there with uh, Brent. And just go ahead and take all that, if you will. 8, 9, 10, and 15. Hear, my son, your father's <clears throat> instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head, and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Verse 15. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their path. All right. And he goes on to say why. For their feet run to evil. In the case of shed blood. Um, and so, here the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the law of your mother. And then what a blessing it will be to you. It will be a graceful ornament on your head. It will be chains about your neck. So we need to provide our children with the proper teaching, with the proper instruction, which, of course, first and foremost, needs to be rooted in the Word of God. And we need to give them many, many warnings, not just one, but continually, as we're bringing them up, about the enticements of this world, the enticements of sinners, and uh, the wrong companions. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. But don't go with them. Um, and... As we read, as Brent read in verse 15, don't walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. Go down a different path. Don't get on that path. How many young people in the Lord's church have been lost because they didn't do what we just read in Proverbs 1? They did get on the path when sinners entice them. The, the, some of their worldly friends said, come on with us, and they went. And again, that's not always on the parents. God knows those situations perfectly. We do not. 
uh, because young people, they grow up and they have free will, but we need to do all we can while we can as fathers and mothers to steer them toward godly companions and warn them about the, the evil companionship spoken of here. Okay. Um, Proverbs chapter 3, 1 through 12. Let's see if we can squeeze that in. Let's take uh, three verses apiece, starting with Andy, then Tiffany, then Jeff, then Marissa, please. Because, Rhonda, you, you rather me skip yours or not? Oh, you're in. Well, I don't want to skip you. I might offend you. All right. So those four right there, then. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then you will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with new wine. My child, don't reject the Lord's discipline and don't be upset when he corrects you. For the Lord corrects those he loves just as the Father corrects the child in whom he delights. Okay, okay so there's quite a bit there, right? Um, what do we have in verses 1 through 12 that stands out to you real quick? In verse 1, uh, he talks about, let your heart keep my commandments. So it's talking about character development first okay. there. Because that's, it's out of the heart is your, uh, your decision making. Okay, good. Let okay. your heart keep my commandments. Because if, if the commands of our parents, which again is the commands of God, is in our hearts, then aren't we going to do them naturally if they're within us? first in our heart, and then the blessing of that, right? How one's life and that young person's life will just, they're going to be benefited greatly in keeping those teachings. Length of days, long life, peace, they will add to you. Um, he then, the father then emphasizes to his son, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Uh, fear the Lord. Depart from the evil, of course. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Were any teenagers ever wise in their own eyes? Any of us as teenagers may be wise in our own eyes. We got it all figured out. Our parents don't have a clue. They don't have to, right? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, some of us may be experiencing a little bit of that right now. Um, he can't hear me yet. He's got his ears still. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it, it's important for us to continue to, to emphasize that to them, point them, keep pointing them to God and let Him direct your paths. And, um, it's going to be health to your flesh, strength to your bones. And then he says, honor the Lord with your possessions. Right? Honor the Lord with your possessions. And don't despise the chastening of the Lord. Why does he chasten us? Because he loves us. And so receive the chastening of the Lord. All right, anything else you want to insert? Okay, Teresa. I think it's really interesting in both Proverbs 1 and 3, that he says... Keep it around your neck or wear it as an ornament. Right. Basically, something that you treasure and you're going to show to everyone, um, even today with her jewelry. Uh, you're keeping it close to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great point. That's emphasized a lot in the Proverbs. Jim, let's squeeze you in. Whenever we were reading verse 4, it says, So you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. First thing I thought of was, what they said about Jesus, he grew in favor inside of God and man. Okay, so whenever we're doing things like this, we become more like Jesus. That's right. When we do things like this, we become more like Jesus. So Proverbs 3, verse 4, it's so find favor and high esteem not only inside of God, but inside of God and man. And that's the same thing said about Jesus in Luke 2. All right, appreciate all the wonderful comments and your contributions to the study. We didn't get through all of it. We're trying to press toward, to, to do that. We just got a little bit left two weeks we'll wrap it up and I'll be putting uh, lesson four questions in the back for you to grab okay thank you